Hi, my name is Thomas, and you're listening to Catholic vs. Catholic. So just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, if you would, please, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe it. I come from a long line of Catholics. My uh, mother was uh, Irish Catholic. My father, he was Anglican, but had a bit of disdain for religion. I went to church every Sunday, went to Catholic schools right through high school, and, and I considered myself a, a Catholic, although my, my understanding of theology was, was pretty limited. And uh, it seemed to me, sitting in the pew at church when I was a teenager in my early 20s, that uh, it just surprised me that the church was able to create such a vast empire with such a poor product, that product being the Mass. Um, I do remember my mom telling me when she was a little girl that the Mass was in Latin. And slowly I kind of just stopped going altogether. Even when I got married and I went a few times with my wife and it just... I had completely lost uh, my faith at that point. Even in God? Uh, yeah, I, I was. I would say that I had become a materialist. So that's just where I was at that point. Uh, but at the same time, I was kind of learning also about how the world worked and uh, like the Federal Reserve and you know some of the the terror attacks. I watched some of those movies on how you know alternative theories. So I was learning more and more that you know the way that we're told the world works is not always. Uh, the truth. So uh, eventually what happened, the, the big event was I heard uh, Hutton Gibson, which is Mel Gibson's father. I heard a radio interview with him and he described how the church had been taken over. I sensed very strongly that what he was saying was uh, correct. And then I ordered his books and I ordered other books and I did a lot of research on the internet and I, I came to the conclusion that the Catholic Church was the true church and that it had been taken over and what year was it when it was taken over 1958 and how long was the transitional period between it being in the hands of christ and then being in the hands of the enemies of christ i guess two days <laughs> everyone was explicitly taking sides within that two-day period no no i think it, it's a complicated issue I, i'll simplify it as best i can there was there was a kind of a malignant faction within the church, um, and, and the church has always been infiltrated to some degree. There's always enemies within the church, and, and I'm not. This is not just strictly my opinion. There's some very prominent Catholic authors. Father Fahey was a very well known writer in the 40s and 50s that said it was the the secret societies uh, that would you know that were doing so much damage. The Masons, the Masons, the Illuminati. There's a few factions there. But in, in the 1903 conclave, uh, at the end of the reign of Leo XIII, there was a Cardinal Rampola who was almost elected, but he was vetoed by a Cardinal on behalf of Franz Joseph, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time. And so that was, they had come very close to capturing the papacy at that point. And, and Rampola was the Secretary of State for Leo XIII. So it shows you just how close they were to uh, controlling the uh, papacy at that point. But Rampola's closest confidant was a man named Bishop Tedeschi, and he had a seminarian named Angelo Roncalli in his seminary and kind of nurtured him and brought him into a position of prominence within the church. He eventually became John the 23rd mm -hmm. in 1958. So I'm just giving you a line of the most powerful group of enemies there. And I'm saying 1958 is the point where the church was taken over, because if you saw the film, on October 26, 1958, the first day of the conclave, there was a, an emission of white smoke. Can you introduce the film? Because people don't know what you're talking about now. Okay. So as I learned the truth about the Catholic Church, I, I realized that there was a lot of facts, there was a lot of clues to the puzzle, but they were all, one was in this book, and one was in another book, and one, and one was in a film or on a website. So I endeavored to take all those pieces of the puzzle the best I could and put it into one documentary film. So I, I did that. The movie's called Papal Imposters, and it's in 12 parts, and it's available on YouTube. Okay. The highlight of the film is actual footage from the 1958 conclave, it was the first day of the conclave, and there was a very clear mission of white smoke that lasted for a long time. 
Yeah, and for the non-Catholic listeners, just explain the, the smoke. In St. Peter's Square, the, the cardinals get together in the Sistine Chapel. They cast a ballot for the Pope, and it's two-thirds plus one will determine a new Pope. And if they get two-thirds plus one, they burn the ballots with dry straw, and it makes a very clear, puffy-looking smoke. If they fail to elect a Pope, they burn the ballots with a damp straw, and it creates a uh, dark, uh, dense smoke. So we, we had a very clear signal that a Pope had been elected. Did the crowd go wild? It appeared that they did go wild. I do have the uh, the newspaper reports from the next day. One of the Roman newspapers had a transcript from Vatican Radio. The Vatican Radio announcer said, there is no doubt a pope has been elected. And he, he kind of went on like that for a few minutes. And then the signal changed to black, and then it turned back to white. But everyone had assumed that a pope was going to be appearing on the balcony. So they waited around for 30 minutes or so, and uh, finally the marshal of the conclave was was in contact with the cardinals inside, and they said that it was a mistake. But it was announced all over the world, like people driving home and listening to the radios, and the news had announced that a new pope had been elected. So no pope appeared, and the conclave continued, and two days later, John the Twenty Third is announced as the new pope. And he's part of that faction? Yeah, he was, you know, he was uh, allegedly a Freemason, uh, worked with the communists. He, he was removed from his teaching positions because he was teaching heresy and teaching the philosophies from some strange uh, characters. So he had a very shady background. And he, he was in, he was the Archbishop of Paris for a long time, and he was very close to the well-known French Freemasons. Uh, so he became, he got elected, and one of the first things he did was to call a council, which became known as Vatican II. Mm. So basically, he got elected, and he right away started a program to destroy the church. So he was elected in 1958, and within 12 years, they were coming out with a new mass that bore little resemblance to the mass that they'd been doing for close to 1,500 years. From your perspective, those that were loyal Catholics and that were not Freemasons, they must have been outspoken with their outrage, and they must have said something, no? No, no. Um, unfortunately, there was very little opposition to the new mass. The church was ripe for the picking. A lot of the uh, priests went along with the uh, changes, maybe not fully aware of what, what what was happening. At my own church, which is which would be Sede Vacantis, where they, they kind of just believe that the uh, Pope fell into heresy. And if you fall into heresy or if you preach heresy ex cathedra, then you are ipso facto excommunicated. So that's kind of how they see it. They, they are, the sede vacante, sede means, uh, sede is seat, vacante is empty, so the empty seat. So there is no pope. Uh, my position is slightly different where I believe that there is someone in the seat, but the seat is being occupied by enemy agents. Okay. Are you familiar with the Arian heresy and how rampant it ran? Yes. Are there parallels that you can draw just from your perspective on what's happening since 1958? Oh, yes. The uh, St. Jerome said that at the time of the Arian heresy, four out of five bishops had embraced the Arian heresy. So there is a precedent. And how did that resolve itself back in the 4th, 5th centuries? I believe they called the council and they condemned it. Um, is that the sort of thing that could happen from your perspective to resolve some of the, I guess you call it these malignant factions, is there a way that we could summon a council and resolve it that way? It would be quite hard, although I'm more optimistic now than I was uh, five years ago, because uh, Pope Francis is really quite bad. And, you know, you saw uh, a few cardinals had written a, a letter. Cardinal Burke was one of them. Asking for clarification? Right. Two of them have since died, by the way. Under mysterious circumstances? Well, I, I don't know the circumstances, but four of them wrote a letter and two of them are now dead. And another one who didn't write the letter but was very critical is, is also died. But, you know, I mean, they're old men too, so. Do you have your own pope now or do you just have Pope Francis? No, there is no pope that I know of. There's an anti-pope. The last pope died in 58? Well, that's the last pope that we can be sure of. But I, I feel fairly confident that Cardinal Siri was elected in 1958. There's been a, a few testimonies to the fact that he was pope. There was a Vietnamese priest went to see him, came back and said that, yes, he, he told me that he was the elected pope. 
Did he accept the election, though? They wouldn't have released the white signal if he had not accepted. It, to create a cardinal, you need to be a pope. But to be a pope, you need cardinals. So there's a sort of a chicken and the egg thing here. If we don't have any cardinals, we can't make a pope. And if we don't have a pope, we can't make cardinals. So how do you resolve that? Well, this is just my opinion. But Cardinal Siri was Archbishop of Genoa until his death in 1989. So he ordained a number of priests and he kept his area, Genoa, very traditional. But did he assume the title of Pope and did he create cardinals? No, but his priests and his bishops are now cardinals. There's three or four of them. They were made cardinals by an antipope? Yes, but appointing a cardinal is not a holy order. Bishop is the fullness of the priesthood, so that that's as far as you go. It's not a separate order. There's no indelible mark on the soul. Right. So a, a priest can actually become a uh, cardinal. Cardinal uh, Odi Viani. He launched the Odi Viani intervention. He was uh, just a priest. So my concern is the sacraments. How do you know that you're getting valid and licit sacraments? Please explain that to me. A lot of times when they're uh, criticizing Traditional Catholics who are outside the mainstream church, they call them illicit. But that just means that they were ordained kind of illegally without the popes or the Diocesan bishop's permission. Yeah, like if it turns out that the Greek Orthodox Church is the one true church, then when the Catholic Church calls them illicit, they're just wrong. They're, they are fully illicit and they are fully valid. And uh, the Greek Orthodox Church is the one true church of Jesus Christ. I don't believe that it is, but from their perspective, that's what they would say, right? Okay, yeah. So I was getting at the difference between invalid and illicit. Yeah, but I'm just illustrating it using the Greek Orthodox because they do have valid sacraments and holy orders, right? And you're in a similar boat from my perspective, and I'm in a similar boat from your perspective. Is that fair to say or no? That order was changed. I do not know whether that order is valid anymore. And Cardinal Ratzinger was the first one ordained using that new method. So I don't know if we have real bishops anymore. So anyone ordained after that is questionable. And, and that's enough for me to just to not obtain uh, sacraments from newer priests or newer bishops. Okay, but is there a line that you follow that has proper orders? Right. The two main lines are the Lefebvre line, which is the Society of St. Pius X, so he was obviously an, a valid bishop, and he ordained lots of traditional priests. Illicitly. Illicitly, correct. The uh, other line is the Tuck line. He was the uh, Archbishop of Vietnam. Okay, and was he a contemporary of Lefebvre? They knew each other? Yes, they did know each other, and they were a part of the resistance. And are they significantly united? Is there an overlap in what they believe? Not really. The two lines disagree about certain aspects of theology, but that's understandable because there's no pope that can settle these differences for us. And which line are you in? I've gone to both. Um, I lived in South Korea for 12 years. There was only the SSPX church there, so that's where I attended while I was there. But they, they kind of recognize the pope, but they don't obey him. So I find that a little hard to sustain the fact that he's the Pope, and I'm just going to ignore him. So I, I, I've chosen the uh, to go to the Tuck line. We're still a, a big minority, but there are, our churches are getting bigger. Our church has doubled in size. Like, it wasn't that big before. It was about 50 attendants, but now there's, there's over 100 in a few years. And I don't know how many of the Nuvis Ordo churches, which is Generally, what the traditionalists called in the mainstream Catholic Church is the Nuvis Ordo Church. And Nuvis Ordo, that's the new order of Mass. So that's the term. When they came out with the new Mass, they called it the Nuvis Ordo Misse. My mom and my the rest of my family all go to the Nuvis Ordo Church. And uh, I don't want them to go to hell. <laughs> so there's a lot of people, a lot of traditionalists are very kind of antagonistic and aggressive. It's not just one-sided, but I certainly hope that if there's any grace to be had in the New World Order Church, that my relatives are, are getting it. Right? I, I rather resolve the situation and, you know, maybe impart a little bit of, of our perspective rather than to antagonize. 
what is the plan or the strategy for unity? Because St. Augustine famously said that we're going to be surprised when we get to heaven. A lot of people we thought were in the church were outside of the church, and a lot of people we thought were outside of the church were actually in the church, and it's very mysterious. And uh, I just want your perspective on unity and the sort of huge numbers of people apparently outside of the true church. Um, yeah. Not really my problem. <laughs> okay. So, so, I mean, then when I say it's not my problem, first of all, I believe that for the average person, or for me, someone who's been through the catechism, there's only one way to salvation, that's through the Catholic Church. How we approach or interact with other re- religions and how we convert them, that is up to people superior to me within the, the Catholic Church. And if they had something for me to do, then I would obey that. But I'm not ordained or called to do anything about that. Okay, but in your day, do you have a daily prayer life? Yes. Does unity fit in there somewhere or not at all? Well, there there is unity. There's there's unity in the mass. You're praying with all Catholics, living and dead. That's the nature of the mass is is unifying. Speaking of the communion of saints. Are there saints that have lived, died, and been recognized, if not canonized, because maybe there's not a canonization process that your church is able to do? Well, there's, we, we certainly wouldn't have as many as John Paul II created. Certainly there was saints, right? Because a saint is anyone who dies and goes straight to heaven. So I'm sure there were, were saints. But uh, was, was Cardinal Siri a saint? Was Lefebvre a saint? I, I don't know. Do you think it's possible, and if so, what sort of probability would you give it, that St. John Paul II is actually a saint? I would say zero probability. Zero? That he is a saint, <laughs> yes. Okay. What, are the, what's, what, are, what probability would you assign that he will make it to heaven? Well, I mean, God, God is the ultimate judge, and he won't send anyone to hell unless they deserve it. Can we talk a little bit more about your journey, like your own personal life? Well, first you have to come to the solid conclusion that the current mass that's available to you is not valid. So that creates a huge burden on you to to locate someplace to go and then kind of go against society and all the trends. It, It was more difficult when I was in Korea because there was one church and it was five hours away. So I would go and there was only a priest there once a month. So I go, I would go once a month. Here we travel about an hour and 20 minutes every Sunday. And then there's a, a big uh, burden of, of homeschooling. We actually send our kids to school and homeschool. But most of the traditional people that I know, their kids are all homeschooled. Uh, and they're using the books. They're using the Baltimore Catholic, the same books they used uh, 50 years ago. Okay, so you like the Baltimore Catechism? Yes, yes. What year was that published? Is it important that it be before 58? In general, as a whole, like when we get a missile, we make sure it's pre-1958. When I buy a Catholic book, I look for the imprimatur and the heel upstat and all that. Do you have something similar in your church? No, no. But yes, I look for that. Do they still use that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They still use that. How much do you know about the old mass? Do you know what they did to the mass? The destruction of the mass is the most obvious evidence that the church has been overtaken and has been run by heretics. I actually entered the church in 2009, so I'm not going to bring with me a wealth of experience and fond memories of the Latin mass. Right. Okay, a lot of Nuvus Ordo goers believe that they simply translated the old mass into English. Into every local language, right? Right, into every local language. But that's not what happened. They removed up to 60% of the old mass, completely removed it. And they were very strategic in how they removed it. Pope Paul VI, who became Pope in 1963, who was really the worst, most of the destruction occurred on his watch from 1963 to 1978. He met with five Protestant ministers and he asked them what they didn't like about the Latin mass. And they told him the sacrificial nature of the Mass and the true presence of Christ on the altar. So he just removed all those distinctly Catholic elements. And what you have now is more or less it's a Protestant Mass. What elements are missing 
today. Is there a consecration? There's still a consecration, but they changed the words of consecration. And just recently they changed them back, but still, if you change the words of consecration, you don't confect the sacraments. They, they really invalidated the Mass when they changed the words of consecration. Do you remember the wording change? Is it something simple that you could recite to the audience? Yes, it is. I have my missile here. Just, to see. Uh, just so you know, I don't attend Mass in English. I attend in Italian and in French. In Montreal? Yeah. Okay. So this is what it says for the consecration of the chalice. This is the original version. For this is the chalice of my blood of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith which shall be shed for you and for many unto the remissions of sins. So in the old one, he says, it will, my blood will be shed for you and for many. And they changed that to will be shed for you and for all. It used to be written in every altar missal. If anyone removes or changes anything in the form of the consecration of the body and blood, and by this change of words does not signify the same thing as these words do, he does not confect the sacrament. The Mass was unchanged for over a thousand years. For them to come and make such a bold change to the Mass, it just stinks. The Church was healthy. And since the changes, there's literally a fraction of the uh, number of vocations or or people attending Mass uh, as there used to be. The crisis can be correlated with Vatican II. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, you'd have to be pretty dumb to deny that. You know, the wacky liberals are very happy with the crisis. They think that it's just getting with the times, right? But the the faithful, what I would consider a faithful Catholic, faithful to the magisterium, they know that there's a crisis since Vatican II. They don't blame the saints or the popes or the faithful Catholics for that. They blame Satan and his minions who are taking advantage of every opportunity to introduce error and lies and corruption and perversion into the church. I mean, no, I don't know anyone that denies that there's corruption and perversion taking place in the Catholic Church. The question is, is there a church? Is the church a perfect society? Is it infallible? Is it, does it have authority? And is it indefectible, meaning that it will always be here until the end? Maybe that's a question for you. What do you think about the promise of indefectibility? Because the Baltimore Catechism makes it very clear that the church is indefectible. Right. And, and I believe I'm in the, within the church right now. <laughs> Yeah, but you're confident that your church will not fall completely. It may go through some hard times, but it will prevail. Well, I do have a book. I, I don't recall exactly what's in it, but it is about the Antichrist. And it says if, if Jesus didn't come and, and shorten the days, that no one would be saved at all. So when it comes to the end, things are going to be bad. So I don't think we'll just be all marching off to church uh, <laughs> without a care when, when the end times come. But you, you mentioned the Arian heresy, but there was also a pope called Anacletus II. Innocent II was elected first, and Anacletus kind of usurped the throne, held it for eight years, and then someone else was elected, and then they, they removed the second one after Anacletus died, and they reinstalled the one that was elected eight years previously. So... There is a precedent for the papacy to be usurped, but never for such a long time, because we're closing in on 60 years now. Can you talk a little bit, I don't know if you know anything about the Avignon papacy. Is, are there any parallels that you draw? The Avignon papacy, was that when there were three popes? Yeah, in France. Right. Yeah, one was called John the Twenty Third, and then, it, like when I said in 1958, Ron Colley became elected, and he took the name John the Twenty Third, which... No one had taken because the last John the 23rd was an anti-pope. Who are some of your favorite popes and some of your favorite saints in the Catholic Church? Pope Pius XI, his encyclicals were really good, very clear, uh, very concise, not ambiguous in the, in the slightest. You know, and that, that's the church's job, to teach and be the guiding light, not to give us things that they say later, oh, that was misinterpreted. If, if they're doing their encyclicals the way they should, there's no room for misinterpretation. And probably St. Helena, the mother of Constantine, who basically made the uh, Roman Empire uh, Christian, she helped to convert her son, and she uh, found the three crosses that Jesus and the two others were crucified on. 
she got her son to give her a bunch of money and they did an expedition to to the location where it had happened and apparently the slivers of the cross are in the pillars in St. Peter's. What you consider the true church, are they eventually going to repossess a lot of the wealth in terms of art and relics and stuff like that? I'm still hopeful. I know that uh, Cardinal Siri ordained a few of those uh, cardinals uh, that are there now and very close to the uh, papacy. So this, it's possible that one of them could get elected and uh, start to clean house. Uh, near the end of my interviews, I'd just like to give my guest a chance to talk directly to the audience. So just as a final thought, what would you say to anyone that's out there listening now? Uh, I would say God is real. Heaven is real. The uh, Catholic Church is the true church, um, but it's not as easy to find as it, as it once was. If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is ask.